All right, good people. Welcome to the Mr. Teacher, Mr. Preacher podcast and YouTube channel, where it is our mission to learn what lasts in athletics and teach it back to you, the athlete, the coach, and the parent. I am Kevin Bota. I am the teacher. That is Jake Train. He is the preacher, and we are excited to have you. Thank you for tuning in. Now, if you are new, we are in our lovely deconstruction of John Wooden's Pyramid of Success, one of the greatest coaches of all time, if not the greatest. And our job during these deep reads is to take one of the themes, at least in this case, in John Wooden's themes, and we read books on them, books on industriousness, books on friendship, books on enthusiasm. These are traits. And we are in our first theme of loyalty, which is being true to yourself and to those, all those depending on you. Keep your self-respect. And that is what we are up to. Um, before we get to that, um, Jake, I, and we get to the book, I, I want to drop people in to a quote. So we start off with getting you focused as a reader and as a listener, um, warmed up. This is more or less our warm up if we we're talking sports terms into the topic. And then we'll get into the book and where you can get the book and things like that. Um, We'll give you kind of a first draft reading. I puzzle the preacher, which is giving you the basic comprehension of the book. We have second draft reading of big topics that we'd like to cover that best fit you. Then we wrap up with metaphors and most valuable ideas. So if you could only take one or two ideas from the reading, what would we get there? Jake, how are you doing? You ready to roll? I'm ready to roll. I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Let's, uh, let's hammer another one out, huh? Hammer number one out, the power of character strengths. We'll get to that. Let's start with this quote that I, I remember from another conceptual framework of loyalty and strengths, which is from Tom Morath and Strengths Finder, the whole Gallup thing, right? Very, very famous um, as well. It's another framework that I admire. But here's the quote, and I think this is going to be one that applies to what we do this entire episode and going forward into loyalty because it's a common pitfall I, I've made and I'm sure others might have made along the way when they become a player, a coach, a parent, somebody in responsibility leadership. So here's the quote. It says, and I quote from Tom Rath, you cannot be anything you want to be, but you can be a whole lot more of who you already are. So I'm going to give you a little bit of think time, Jake. Now, this is a debatable topic, especially that first line. I'll, I'll say how I interpreted this is that I see a lot of athletes or even coaches take on what they perceive as traits or personas that they must become in order to fulfill some imaginary role or, you know, perception of the way they see themselves. And, and it sometimes isn't always a good fit. So you see the kid who is maybe a little bit more introspective be the rah-rah kid then. Or you see somebody who was typically very playful become very square. And, and, and so I see a lot of the I must be this in order to step up to whatever this next level is versus accentuating or doubling down on what you already got, what you got you there. So I want to pass that to you. What do you think about you can't be anything you want to be, but you can be more of who you already are in the concept of loyalty and being true to yourself? Yeah, the idea that you can be anything that you want to be is uh, a little misleading, huh? Um, I definitely agree. I think there are expectations that are put on people that force them to do things, to be things that they aren't comfortable being or don't want to be, and we think that we're helping them grow, uh, but we're asking them to do something that's outside of who they are and their strengths and then we'll get frustrated when who we want them to be doesn't match our expectation of them or what we want for them and then and then we lose them and they lose passion and all sorts of fun stuff so i think man over the last five years i'd say there's there's been a real power and interest for me in learning myself because it reveals so much about my past and it allows me to have better control over the future so it's it's so powerful to really understand who you are um, and why you are that way uh, and i think there's a lot of ammunition behind understanding that you're not 
who you are just because <clears throat> you popped out of the ether that way. Uh, but experiences, the people right. around you um, all impact that. And so the more you can understand that, the more you can empower yourself to, to have success in the future. I agree. I want to be vulnerable. So I want to get very specific here, okay? As an athlete and then as a coach and then as a – I'll even go as a teacher, okay? So two times I got it wrong, one time I got it right. So as an athlete, all right, junior year, all right, baseball, all right? I'm, I'm a pretty good player on the team, and then I become a de facto captain. We didn't have captains for baseball. We did for football and basketball, so I was a captain for those – um, and sometimes you have leadership around you that you play your role. Like this person does this, so you don't have to do that. Where in baseball is kind of next man up, next person up. But I remember distinctly, we lost our final game, my junior to a very, very good team. And then we got a chance to replay them my senior year. So this is the revenge tour, right? And I remember multiple people coming up to me, a couple teammates, my brother, coach, suggesting I give a speech before the game. Now, I am not a rah-rah guy, okay? Not, he's already laughing because he can't imagine me doing this. I'm more of a not completely stoic Joe Maurer, but lead by example. I don't mind being, you know, laughing, being a part of the team. But in terms of PJ flucking this thing, I am not that guy, all right? There is no win one for the Gipper speech coming out of Kevin. And I remember trying to do this. So this did happen, Jake. I don't even know if you know this. I tried to get up before as the coaches walked out. Hey, guys, I have something to say. I don't have a clue what I said, but I remember shaking in my boots. Just I didn't know what to say. And like, so I pulled some stereotypes or some, you know, can phrases that I'd heard and probably remember the Titans or something like, let's go get them, guys. And we probably lost. I don't want them to gain another yard. Hey, Blitz. All the Kevin, we're playing baseball. Uh, uh, that's all I got. That's all I got. Which. Your helmets on. Let's go. Uh, so that didn't go well. I, w I was not a fan of that. And then I'll go to as a teacher. I remember being a teacher uh, for six years, English teacher, six years. And remember how impressed I was with gregarious teachers, like the big personalities, outgoing, just love that limelight, that student interaction. And that exhausted me. I, and I love don't get me wrong. I love teaching the whole deal. Uh, it just didn't fit me. So same thing like with the player giving a speech before a game. I thought every teacher had to look like this. I developed this whole archetype in my mind. Like that's what a good teacher is. And didn't realize that there was multiple ways of doing that. But one time I did get it right. And it was coaching. So I ended up coaching at the college level football. Wide receivers of all things, Jake. I haven't played a down a wide receiver in my life, except in the backyard. Uh, and I remember getting the playbook like a couple days before we even started practice. This all kind of came together quickly. And this is the time where I did get to be myself because I realized what they were asking me to do. And I knew what I was good at. And I took the same strengths, which we'll talk about later. And every time we had our little wide receiver breakdown drill, I had something completely off the walls. I had challenges. I had Gatorades. I had, you know, OBJ, you know, one-handed. I mean, anything that I could possibly find to keep things fresh for these guys and to make them better players. I asked them what they wanted to do. You know, like, what do you want to get good at? Well, we need footwork coach. Okay. Well, I figured that out and used whatever props. I remember dragging barrels, like those big blue, remember the blue barrels that you rolled down the hill with? Those cones, like nobody knew what I was doing, but I remember getting looks from the other coach, like, what are you doing today, Vota? And that was one time I got it right, where it was spot on, it was creative, and I was able to drive engagement by just being me. And then also throwing balls as hard as I could, like Brett Favre, you know, just because that's fun. So two times I got it wrong, one time I got it right. Did you have anything like that where you – did nail it on the head or maybe you didn't nail it on the head in terms of being who you be more of who you already are uh, see so for me it was expectations i was always more of the quiet leader um but when i spoke people listened or it did have an impact so then people like why don't you do it more it's like because if i did it more it wouldn't have much of an impact 
because it's not me. Uh, yep. But I mean, I, I remember the senior year soccer game. We had been getting our butt whooped a couple times and I was done. I was done with it. Um, and so we had our halftime talk. And then before we went on the field, I don't exactly remember what I said, but I was pissed off enough where it got everybody's attention. Uh, I don't think I swore. Maybe one slipped out. <laughs> now, Jake went to a private school, people. So this would be this would be shock factor galore. Yeah, it, it would be. Uh, and, you know, it wouldn't be surprising if, like, a kid just up and left the huddle, huddle immediately and like, oh, Jake said this word. So maybe I did. Uh, I don't think so. But it, it got everyone's attention, and it was a whole different performance in, in the second half. And Why did you do this more? Because it's, it's not me. Like, if, if I did that all the time, it just wouldn't carry the weight. Uh, but, I, I mean, I can, I can give a break big hoorah one for the gipper you know don't want you to gain another yard uh kind of a deal but i think part of that's because i have kind of a chameleon personality where i can adapt and it's gonna sound bizarre but i've watched enough movies that i can mirror like i can mirror herman boone immediately in front of people and actually it would appear that it's somewhat genuine so that's going to serve me well in a lot of ways where even when something isn't super genuine, it looks genuine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a mirror in my personality. Like I see something and I just start mimicking it naturally. And uh, we'll get to that. And, and so the point of this warm up was truly, okay, there are times when we are authentic, we're loyal to ourselves. I'm using those words interchangeably at the point and times where we're not. And the, the, what we're, Focusing on as we start is 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 fe that feeling of that difference when there is a fit and it brings out the best in us and when there's not and it it just doesn't I don't want to say it's inauthentic but it doesn't feel right you know it's it's you know it's a shoe size too small or it's a you know fat guy in a little coat I hope we can say that on YouTube but you know that's a good movie um, what's up Tommy boy so that's what we're gonna look at is being more true to yourself and one of those first steps is identifying you know, what does that even mean in terms of who are you? And we're going to look at one of those frameworks. So let's transition to the book that we started with, with loyalty. And it's The Power of Character Strengths. I'm holding it up on the screen, if you're watching on the screen. Uh, and it's Appreciate and Ignite Your Positive Personality. It's an official guide from the VIA Values in Action, VIA, Institute on Character. And this is by Ryan M. Niniak, I hope I said that right, and Robert E. McGrath. And this comes uh, from Drs. Chris Peterson and Drs. Martin Seligman, founders of Positive Psychology. And I'll get to them. But I do want you to know where you can get your book. This is our stop for bookshop.org. And that is our underdog book selling people who help you get books from independent bookstores all across the U.S. So you can know that if you buy from bookshop.org, you're getting it from good people. And so as we are book people and we deconstruct books and read them and apply them to sports, um, we now let you know where you get it. So if you're interested in The Power of Character Strengths or any of the other books we covered, check the description and the links below. You can support the channel, support the independent bookstores at bookshop.org. With that said, Jake, let's get into our first draft reading. And the way we're going to do this, I'll give you a couple terms. We're going to play Puzzle the Preacher so you can match this. And then I'm going to give you just some of the highlights of the grounding and the introduction of the book before we dig into some character strengths of yourself and myself. The first term to know is virtues. Virtues are the six core characteristics valued by philosophers and theologians across culture and time. So as the 50 scientists and Peterson and Seligman um, went to study, you know, what is good about people what they found is these kind of six cores. So kind of think big buckets, okay? Underneath those, they identified 24 character strengths. And character strengths are, as they define it, positive personality ingredients. I like that word. Of a fulfilling life, the pathways. That's another good word I like. To the virtue. So how do I get to that virtue at its best? By exemplifying those traits and as we'll see we're a mixture of all of them 
you know, some more than others. It's not like you don't have something just because you scored low on it. Um, it just means that these these ones come easier to you. And let's start there. So I'm going to share my screen. If you are not viewing along, you're listening along, I will audibly help you so we can see. What I'm going to actually ask Jake to do is, is he's going to play a matching game. So I'm going to give him the virtue and he's going to identify or attempt to identify, which is the fun part for me is the attempt to identify what is the definition of that virtue. And then in the second section, we're going to look at, okay, that's the virtue. What are the characteristics or the character strengths that go with it? So I got it right this time, Jake. We're good. I got the even the right, the right quiz. Um, and we'll go from there. All right. Can you see my screen? Good, sir. I can see your screen. All right. Now, Jake's job is to match. So I'm going to read. And so we have the virtues on the left and we have the definitions up top. So, Jake, I'm going to actually go and read the definition first and then you can pick the single word. I think that would be how this can go quickest. Okay. Let's give the audience what the virtues are. We got wisdom, courage, humanity, justice, temperance, and transcendence. So, uh, the quotes that Kevin is going to read, that definition fits into one of those virtues. Bingo. Thank you for clarifying. And, and we don't expect you to know this or memorize it. This is why we start here is the comprehension level. So, Jake, of those six, what are the strengths that help you manage habits and protect against excess? Temperance. Number two, strengths that help you connect to a larger universe and provide meaning mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh. uh, let's go transcendence okay. and you could change your answers as you see the other ones here so number three is strengths that help you in a community or group-based situation humanity Strengths number four that help you exercise your will or face adversity. Courage. Courage. Strengths that help you in one on one relationships. Number five. Well, come on, man. Yeah. I'm going to say that's humanity. Okay, so you're going to change this one Strengths to justice. Strengths that help you in community. Strengths that help you gather use. Okay, so the last one. So I'm jumping ahead. Strengths that help you gather and use knowledge is wisdom. Okay. There's a fun uh, lesson to be learned there. Knowledge and wisdom and understanding and strengths that help you in community or group-based situations. That doesn't sound like justice, but none of them really sound like justice. We're going to go with justice, though. Okay. We'll see if you're right. Now, this may help you. We'll see. Oh, so boy. same thing. We have the six virtues on the left, and then I have the the 24 character traits into those buckets as we go forward. So, one, two, do I have this right? I don't have six. Son of a gun. We're missing one. We'll work with it. Is I thought it... you said you had the right form, Kevin. Oh, I oh, do. There it is. There it is. It was just too hiding. big. Okay. Too big. Okay. Okay. All right. Number one is appreciation of beauty and excellence. That's a whole thing. Gratitude, hope, humor, and spirituality. Which one do you think that falls under? Transcendence. All right. Ooh, what's up? Right click. Bravery, perseverance, honesty, and zest. And that is courage. Creativity, curiosity, judgment slash critical thinking, love of learning, and perspective. Oh, let's go. Wisdom. Like the upturn. Uh, <laughs> love, love, kindness, and social intelligence. Humanity. There's nothing like an upturn on a word to show everyone that you have no idea what you're no saying. No idea. That's funny. Teamwork, fairness, and leadership. I'm Ron Burgundy. Justice. Okay. And then last one that we could not see that I'm really thankful was there is forgiveness, 
humility, prudence, and self-regulation. Temperance. I, mean, yeah. I feel good about those ones. Yeah, they, those ones seem to be a little bit more, little help, more helpful. Let's see if you got the other one right. So I'm gonna submit. Did you beat beat the preacher? Let's see. I, don't I know. am the preacher. I beat myself. Boom. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> twelve out of twelve. Yes. He nailed them all. He <sighs> is right. Uh, so Jake is right on those, um, and those are the ones that align. If you can win a perfect score and you didn't actually cheat, that's good too. So. That's what we see. So we have these virtues, so these big buckets that we're going to be aiming for um, to live a fulfilling life. And then there are ways to do that. And we tend to gravitate in them. So I, I want to give you a couple highlights before we jump in from the book uh, that you need to know about character strengths and the power of them. The first thing that I want to say is that everybody, and, and usually I don't say something like this, um, is truly special you know this is a book about what it says is about what is best in you and your many strengths of character like you, you the way you use your strengths makes you unique and special even people who have like maybe even the same top five which are your signature strengths may exemplify those differently and to prove that they go quite a few pages later and say this is unbelievable if we did a true false section i would have totally stumped you jake it says, interestingly, no one has the same profile character strengths as you do. So of those 24, if you take this survey, which we encourage you, that's step one. There are over, Jake, 600 sextillion possible combinations. That is the number six followed by 23 zeros of the 24 character strengths. So profiles are rarely exactly the same. And that is cool in and of itself. So when we talk about being loyal and true to yourself. You can draw inspiration from people who have similar traits than you do or people you look up to, but in the end, you're going to be you. You know, I think comedians have said this, like this comedian tried to be like this comedian and ended up like themselves. This comedian tried to be like that comedian and ended up like themselves. So we're going to try and avoid that and just really talk about character, the, you know, with the goal of really making your life better. It's the part of your personality that other people tend to admire, respect, and cherish. Admire, respect, and care, cherish. That is what character is. And the way this book is broken down is they'll, is we have this introduction where it tells you about, you know, what are character strengths and where do they come from? Then they go, care, you know, character strength by character strength under those six virtue buckets. And then they give you an implementation plan. And I do, again, want to highlight, this is, why did we pick this one? Why didn't we pick character strengths? Why didn't we pick Enneagram? Why didn't we pick Myers-Briggs? For our purposes, we could have, right? We could have used, I respect that. I tend to take a baseball card approach to all of these. I tend to like this one because one, it's free. You can go take it. It's right there for you. You can upgrade to get more detailed analysis. Um, the second was, this, this is one that was a part of the founding of positive psychology. So I highly respect Chris Peterson and Martin Seligman and their work in the founding of positive psychology and finding what's best in each person. I like that mission and we got to start somewhere, right? If you're in the arena of looking for the best in people, you're doing a good job. So, um, this one's been very much validated and is a useful language and framework. So we all can communicate on the same page. Character strengths. Next one, all right, are the basic elements of our identity. So when I hear wouldn't say, okay, we got to be true to ourselves and then be true to others we leave, this is a great place to begin. When we express these character strengths through our thoughts and actions, research says we tend to feel happier, more connected, and more productive. I like those things. <laughs> I don't know how much role you play. This is good. Mm -hmm. And... I found this one interesting, even though I don't want to go too far into it, is that the strengths can be broken down into strengths of the head. So, you know, kind of like we have introvert, extrovert. So we have strengths of the head, analytical, logic-based, and thinking fo focus. So judgment, prudence, fairness, level learning perspective. And then we have strengths of the heart. So things that are feelings, intuitions, emotional relationships, kindness, love, humor, gratitude, and spirituality. No strengths fall perfectly into any category. I don't want to get into the line drawing fallacy. And they acknowledge that uh, to our credit and their credit. Um, they do a good job of the explanations of each. 
to wrap character strengths before we begin and get into our second draft is there's this term called signature strengths. So Jake had not taken this before and that's great. He's started this journey. He went, he had other things he had learned. So he's not, not self-aware. He's very self-aware. This is just another thing to layer onto what he's known. But when you take the quiz, if you take the quiz, which we encourage you to do of the 24, your top five are what are known as signature strengths. These are the strengths that are the strongest or most prominent in your strengths profile. They matter to you most and they are most central to your identity. So when we go forward here into our in the meat of the episode and we apply this as a player, a coach, and a parent, know that we're going to work with those top five. We're not going to work with the whole gamut. That would be a very long episode. We're going to look at those top five. And what those top five are in order to be authentic or be loyal to yourself is number one, they're essential. They're essential to who you are. This is the three E's. They're effortless, meaning you probably already done these. You just didn't have the word for it. Didn't know that character strengths and virtues were a thing. They're natural. They flow easy. They're one of the flow is the best single identifier of it. So it's effortless. And number three is they're energizing. So they uplift you and they not just uplift you, but when you get to do these things, that's one thing the, that I wanted to highlight at some point during this episode is, and we'll see it as through Jake and I is there's an overflowing that a spillover effect onto other people. Like you take that thing that you are and it's almost like, um, old faithful and Yellowstone. It just, you know, a geyser, it overflows and everybody can't be, in, but be impressed with that. And that's where we're going to go. Uh, the book is, this one's more of uh, an overview. There are two other books about interventions and more of the research of where it came from. This is probably one of the more accessible ones, uh, of the three, if I had to pick. And if you read this book, uh, you'll get the character strengths and what they go through is a general structure of what it is, why it matters and like how to do it. So there are things on spotting the strength, why it's valuable, reflecting on it. Um, how to take action in your relationships, work, community, and inside, underusing your strength, overusing your strength, and then finally a, a motto for each of these. And that's the way the book's laid out. So you can really cherry pick actually your top five and just read those. Uh, the book is still worth it though in, in its entirety if you're getting to know people. Jake, anything that stands out to you just from a comprehension, you know that there's virtues, you know what they are, you know that there's character strengths under that. Uh, anything stand out to you on loyalty or um, just general impressions before we move on to our big portion here? Nothing of shattering. Uh, I always enjoy doing these. I used to hate them, and now I really enjoy them because it's just another layer to add on to understanding yourself and where you're coming from and what your um, strengths might be. And I think what's great about all of these is they always have a different twist or a different look at yourself. Uh, that certainly there are going to be reoccurring themes that come out. There are going to be things that aren't surprising the more you do them, but there's always things that do stand out and always things that are like, oh, I never thought about it in that way. Uh, and, and sometimes it's just how they word or how they break down a certain trait or you know, whatever way they're breaking your personality down that sticks out to you. And you're like, oh, yeah, I never thought about that or never would have articulated myself that way, but that makes a lot of sense. And so that's that's why I appreciate these. These are always good. I always enjoy doing them. They're always there's always something that sticks out. They're like, oh, had no idea about myself, but that makes a lot of sense. I agree, and and it's not only good for you, but the people around you, because mm -hmm. then they, they can come alongside you and help you be more of again who you already are. Versus, I like that versus always constantly filling holes in our weaknesses. And not that it's not good to work on your weaknesses, but strengths is the way to go. And one of the most entertaining things of these for me is always taking them and then sharing them with my wife and then just getting her reaction to them. You know, sometimes like I'll, I'll get something and I'll still, it'll say a blurb about me and I'm thinking that it's spot on. And then I say it, my wife will just look at me like, huh? They got that from you. That makes no sense. Yeah. So it's always, it's always a lot of fun to, say them and and have a little bit of fun banter back and forth with the person who knows you best 
Yeah. Good transition to, to this next stage. This is the meat of the episode. We did the quiz together, the survey, and we have our top five and we flipped a coin and how we want to break this down is we want to go from all of our perspectives of the audience we serve, player, coach, parent. Jake won the toss and he picked player. So we're going to apply Jake's signature strengths, the ones he got to himself back when as a player. So we are going to model for you how he might apply these practically. And in order to do that, we are going to identify, okay, what were the strengths? That's number one. We got to say, okay, what are they? Number two is spotting them in himself or others. That's the first step in the, in the workbook or the playbook at the end of this book. Then we are going to move to harken back to our friend, James clear of identity based habits of one, I, who are you? And then prove it to yourself with small wins. So we're going to coach Jake in the past and say, which one of these did you do a lot of? You know, I mean, how would you have brought that particular strength to your team and say, oh, yeah, I did do that. Like, yeah, I checkbox. I, I was really good at that one. Ooh, this strength I didn't use a lot of. It was underused here. I, I wish I would have done that. Okay, what would be a strategy to do that? So we're going to model for you how this might look as a player. Then we'll flip to me as a coach. So Kevin's got these strengths. Third person talking is always fun. Third person, uh, third person talking aside, here's my strengths. And Jake will help coach me through that and saying, okay, Kevin, you're a coach. Here's how, what you can bring to the table to be more of who you already are. And then we'll wrap here as parents and say, okay, yeah, we got these 10 strengths between us. How might we coach our family or be a parent in, in, in a youth sports or sports context? And then we'll wrap up with our most valuable idea. Jake, you ready to start with you? Yeah, let's go for it. Oh, man. I told him he was one complex SOB because Jake, if you did not know, took this survey, the VIA Character Strength Survey, and got not one, not two, not three, not four, but five signature strengths in five different virtue categories. So Jake doesn't have like three in one section or two and two and no, he is all over the board. So this will be fun. The first one, I want to read them off in order, is humor. Jake has number one, his first strength was humor. Two is fairness. Three is forgiveness. Four is perspective. And five is social intelligence. And each of these, like I said, fell under a different virtue bucket. His first one, humor, where is humor? Is under transcendence. Fairness is under justice. Forgiveness is under temperance. We have that one in common. Number four is perspective. That was in wisdom. And number five was humanity uh, or social intelligence, which is in humanity. So knowing your strengths, Jake, I, let's start here with spotting it in self and others. Have you seen yourself using these as a captain? So we're going to stay as in the captain context as a player. Um, of the five, and we're not going to necessarily do all of them, which one of these has really stood out to you? Like, yeah, that one really got me. Like, I did that all the time. We'll start with humor. Yes, obviously, I I use that as a like most of the most of words that come out of my mouth are sarcastic in a lot of ways. So this one I definitely used. How did I use it? I think I I think it's for me. It's a tool to connect with people and to is a sign to kind of put all judgment down. Like a lot of times I'll just either acknowledge my shortcomings in a sarcastic way through humor, or I'll acknowledge the other person's shortcomings uh, and shortcomings. Like, you know, they, they take a shot and miss it by a mile and a half. Right. It's hard for me to bite my tongue and be like, Oh, good try. Keep it up. You know, like, <laughs> no, that was, that was pretty awful. I think you just, I, I think you just killed a bird flying by what on earth was that? And and crack a smile at them, and it just allows both of us to put our guards down relationship uh, relationship wise and connect in that way. So I definitely use that one a ton, and I use it outside of sports too. What I know, really squarely, like that is that is my way to make myself feel comfortable around people, 
and to try and get them to feel comfortable around me. Okay. Um, whether I'm playing a sport or not, that's, that's still my number one tool. And I think God has blessed me with just a good enough sense of humor to get by with it. Uh, so that one has stuck out. I'm going to say, I'm going to jump down to the fifth one and say social intelligence. And this is one that I probably wish I would have used more as a player. But I remember even at 16, 17, feeling what other players felt like I just would see an interaction happen and I could, my brain would automatically go like, well, how did that make him feel? That was a question that I would ask uh, quite frequently. And I think what I would have wished I would have done more with is acted on that, those thoughts and feelings of we had a kid who played soccer and we had a coach that was intense and it just became a known thing that when this coach showed up, this kid was going to play just horribly. Like everyone. Aww. We'd, we'd give him crap before the game sometimes. Um, and when he wasn't there, I, he was a whole different player. Okay. And in those cases, we all kind of used humor, uh, probably to his detriment more than anything else. And looking back on it, I wish that would have been something that I used because I feel like I saw it before everyone else did and just go to him and open up that conversation because I knew what he was feeling. And I think more people than, than we thought of were, were feeling the same way. Uh, and to get that out and be able to process that probably would have helped significantly instead of internalizing it. And then you tend to put that same feeling or intensity on everyone else around you, including the players, but they view you the same way that the coach does. Um, so there are, there are ways I certainly, the social intelligence I definitely used, I wish I would use more uh, as a player. I think that would have made me a, a much better teammate and made performances as a team probably much better too. Yeah, and I want to hold this example and work through it with your other strengths too because I have his playbook here, okay? So I'm ahead of him and I've thought about this and I want to use that example, but I want to come back to humor first and then we'll come to that one because then we'll layer in your other three strengths, like how you might have used those. Okay. So what we're doing is we're exploring Jake's signature strengths. How do they manifest? How could they be used? And even this conversation right now that we're having is a win. Just think of this. We know what he's good at and we're thinking about situations he can use it in in context. And then that gives him more dopamine and more positive, you know, affirmation to continue doing those things. All right. So we're solidifying that. Let's go back to humor though. So you said you've done humor. I want to read some of the suggestions from the book. So this is just an overview. I'm not, you know, cookie cuttering you, but you tell me what stands out to you in terms of, I do a lot of that or, you know, fill a gap. You're like, okay, this is here. So here's some things from the book about humor. Uh, that describe humor. Your motto for humor is that you approach life playfully, making others laugh and finding humor in difficult and stressful times. You just said that in another way. <laughs> Some suggestions about the book or characteristics of somebody who scores high in humor is you are a good teaser, like you teasing. There's teasing that goes on. If you're on Jake, there's going to be teasing. You may, you may get, you may get hit. There are playful comments, joking. Typically a funny storytelling of some sorts. In Jake's case, it would probably be a movie reference or something. Or remember when this, harken back. Um, sarcasm in a good way. Now, some people suggest in the world, which I disagree with, sarcasm is bad. I am not on that team, and I don't think Jake is either. You have a high degree of capacity to find the funny. And that this is one links to your um, strength of perspective because you can see the big picture and you don't blow things out of proportion. Catastrophizing is a very common flow blocker and you don't, you're not prey to that. <laughs> so I'm jealous. Catastrophizing, like, oh, this is a way bigger deal than this. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> the, and I'll get to and then four things. So four things that were suggested as habits for you. Right. Identity based habits as a humorous individual. The one from the book, and then there's three more, was a humor diary. Like trying to find three funny things a day. Uh, that is that number I'm not really tied to. I'm more tied to the humor diary in general. Like just 
like I'm almost like a joke book of just things that you found amusing across time in a context. Um, kind of the theater of the absurd, as, as it were. Uh, the ways your humor helps is it builds camaraderie. So you're a guy that uses humor to build the team, right? That's kind of the glue that links people together is this ability to you tease somebody, they tease you back, and somebody shouts from the peanut gallery and like, hey, who, who, what? Talk, and then you throw them under the bus, and and that's a good thing on a team, right? You need that. Um, the one that you did mention was diffusing tension. So when things do get too tight and everybody gets too robotic, you're able to break that down. And then the one that I didn't hear you mention, which I would love to hear if this was a thing, is the celebrating with joy. So I imagine like football we're in football season as we record this, somebody scores. And the linemen come over and they're like, just, ah! you know, I didn't ever see you as that guy. Uh, so that would be not one you have to do. It was just an idea. So when you see somebody do something great, you're the one that helps celebrate with that just overwhelming sense of joy, like, um, and whatnot. So from the humor perspective, is there anything that affirmed you, anything that you like that you'd apply or would have applied as a player? Well, the teasing is hilarious because I don't know that there's anyone on planet Earth who's been teased more by me than you. <laughs> <laughs> and part of that's because you're an easy target, but <laughs> you yes. certainly have gotten the brunt of that over the years. Yes, I have forgiveness in my top five, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so do I. So we just forgive and we move on. It is great. <laughs> it's great. Um, the, you know, the playful thing is quite interesting because I am outwardly very stoic. So humor, obviously, you think laughing, jovial. For the most part, I'm a pretty stoic uh, person in the public square, especially when it comes to athletics. So as a player, I was very stoic. As a coach, a lot of what you see is stoicism, especially if you're a parent of someone on my team. Um, that would typically come out more in training, right? I used it often as a motivation tool. So if we're working on finishing one day, perhaps, you know, and we're, we're having a tough time scoring, whatever, or just trying to build some excitement and, and no one's smiling or there's not much joy going on. That's typically where that will come in. Like I'll just naturally all of a sudden I'll be showing something, I'll put the ball on the goal and then I'll just act like a knucklehead, right? Celebrating my situation and getting all excited. So it comes up in a very specific way. Uh, and just with humor being my strength, I think it's very interesting that I tend to have such stoicism mm -hmm. um, in in the same way of kind of bringing unity. It's amazing how, mo like you brought it up, movie quotes and lyrics really help bring people together. Like everyone finds those certain things because they're so cultural. Um, they're very unifying things. So I have, I would say one of my... <clears throat> strengths and humor is being able to come up with the right movie quote at the right time or the right lyric at the right time. And the lyric thing mm -hmm. is actually funny because I think people find more funny because it's number one, I put myself out there by singing it, which it's not like it's coming out angelic by any means. Uh, and it's just so unexpected. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in, in finding ways to do that, it, I think helps bring people together. And I didn't know it at the time right now. I know it. And, I'm interjecting as much humor as I can into team meetings and uh, um, huddles because, co correct me if I'm wrong here, but laughter can be a great group flow trigger. It absolutely, it absolutely is. So we we tend to do that, and and you know a lot of what I do is get the get the kids talking, and quite frankly, just <laughs> tear them to shreds um, in a very you know humor way in a very insignificant way like um you know hey what's the best fast food burger and someone says in and out and i will just i'll go insane you gotta be crazy are you kidding me how you come up with in and out well would you enjoy sitting in line for 30 minutes for an average burger that's something that stands out to you is good what's you got brain damage what's going on mm -hmm. kind of deal like that and then everyone likes to jump in and kind of raise whatever and i think it's just a matter of making sure it's not always the same target because that'll that will wear people down but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting how I've used humor over the years and how that's stepped out in my personality is 
I would like to tell you it's to make other people feel comfortable, but mm -hmm. it, it started and its primary thing was to make me feel comfortable around people. That's fair. I see the, the parallel here between humor and social intelligence for you because the middle section is more of your stoicism, mm -hmm. the fairness, forgiveness perspective that you have. It's interesting as I've known you and see you down on this paper, I can see these things like where you can step back and then you step in. And I think there probably have been times where it was hard to step in and hard to step back. And that struggle between those two things. Because I see you have as a really good balance, as much as I make fun of you of being across the board, of being a really good balance of strengths of the head and strengths of the heart. And you have three of one and three of the other. No, no, three of one and two of the other. So with that said, let's go to this example of this particular athlete, okay? So you're the mm -hmm. captain on this team, all right? Mm -hmm. so let's talk about the social intelligence, and I want to weave in these other three just to end this. Um, I think this is a really good example. I'm glad we have the case study. We totally planned this, by the way. Uh, <laughs> is social intelligence, to affirm you, is the ability to read others and knowing what makes people tick. You have a high EQ. You're aware of other people's feelings. You thought that. I don't think that. Um, and you can express your emotions accordingly. Um, you are able to track, track things and respond to them. And essentially you are Dale Carnegie. You know how to win friends and influence people. And the way you do that is through active listening, empathy, and conflict resolution. The one you said you wish you had. Now let's layer in some of your other strengths. So fairness, forgiveness, and perspective. So I'm going to go one by one. And then you tell me how you would handle the situation with your strengths. So these other three, because I, 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 the first step was, okay, I'm aware this kid plays poorly under this individual. Okay. Not uncommon. One thing that you have is perspective. You have, you, you see the forest and the trees, you know, the mission and vision of being a player. Um, you, you, you can get to the heart of the problem and be proactive with it and offer advice and support. So in perspective, people come to you for that, right? They want your ability to see that they can't see. Cause some people only see through like a scope. Other people are looking at like the whole panorama. You're a panorama person. Mm -hmm. And what that was suggested was that you can let the person know about long-term vision, adapt to change, or the one that I was here that I was hoping we'd touch on eventually for perspective was mentorship, where if you are an athlete, especially in the high school arena, and you're a senior, you're no matter the size of your school, you're a person of influence. And to take on that strength and to intentionally mentor somebody up of underclassmen of some sorts, or even a teammate if, if need be, um, and build them up. So one thing is perspective. Like you could have brought perspective to this person. This other one is fairness. And I'll admit, I haven't seen as many examples of this study, and especially in sports context, as you got older, as we diverge past. Uh, but that strength is all about justice and inclusion, and especially including in decisions. So you want people's input. And you don't think it's right that there's favoritism, like unfair favoritism. Like if you've earned like your keep at the table, that's different. Mm -hmm. um, the suggestions were about playing time, transparent decision-making and addressing a bias and discrimination. So this is one where you see this as an unfair thing to this player and you would want to resolve it. Well, forgiveness is this last one. And I don't know if you'd actually be able to get to this. It's the ability to let go. It's, you, you know, you find it easy to win friends. You have mercy. You're able to model that. You, you know, you're able to let go of small irritants. Like if somebody cuts you off, it doesn't ruin your whole day. Um, but in terms of a culture as a player, you have the capacity to forgive. Somebody messes up, you can forgive them. doesn't mean you condone it or you completely forget it. You do give people the second, third chance if they deserve it. You lead by example and you provide support. So, in this case, let's go back in time and, and use your strengths in this once real situation. How would you take perspective, forgiveness, fairness, maybe even a little humor to help this player play better? So you're in this captainship role. This is a little bit of your job to make sure he can play. Any thoughts on how you would do that, knowing what you know of what I just added? Yeah, knowing who I am. So I'd start the conversation out with the humor. So some comment. Uh, I mean, just saying <laughs> the humor is saying the problem out loud. Mm -hmm. Man, you really suck when he's around. 
and just letting it sit there. It's just like, what you can do with that <laughs> kind of deal. And then immediately go into the social intelligence of, yeah, you're not the only one. I get it. Right. Um, then I would probably go to perspective of that's one man's opinion. Why do you care so much? What what weight does he have on that on, on you on that? Why do you why do we care here? Mm-hmm. Right, like one person's opinion. Right, have you asked what my opinion is of you? Mm-hmm. Oh no, you, you don't. No, okay. You you have one singular focus when he's around, and it's him. Mm-hmm. We need to stop that. Right, uh, and then I would acknowledge the. A lot of it was unfair. I think that's that's what we realized is like it felt like when he made mistakes, they were amplified by the coach 10 times more than when others would make mistakes. Mm-hmm. So bringing that out of just acknowledging, giving the perspective, like, yeah, I'm a, I agree with you. I think this is social intelligence too. I agree with you. That's unfair. Mm-hmm. It's okay that we acknowledge that it's unfair. And then I think the ultimate solution is forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Let it go. You have to let it go. Right. If you want anyone, if you need a, someone to focus on 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 your performance and what we think of you then pick me because i love you yep. i think you do a wonderful job i think when you are mentally free of that you're help us so much so i will always be on that team so if you want an opinion come come find me screw the rest of it <laughs> that was gold holy cow i yeah. don't oh knocked wow. all of them all knocked them all now in this case we didn't have to use them all. I hope you're starting to get the picture, whether you're listening or you're watching along. How powerful is that? Imagine being on the receiving end as that player to a teammate. Right now, let's imagine. I'm just going to pretend a little bit that this hap- this this event. So this coach is here. He plays poorly. This conversation just happened. Jake talked to me like I was the player. Okay. Now I let go of this. I have a, now a great teammate, probably even better friend. And then I go forward with kind of a screw you mentality. Like I don't have to do this anymore. And you know, you know why sports is so great is because that kid would score that go ahead goal in that playoff game, right? That's how the karma of like beauty of, of, of it works. I think the Missouri kicker, as I was, I was just perusing in the last few days, he missed a kick last year against Auburn to like take it to the overtime. And then this year hit a school or SEC record 61 yard field goal to be Kansas state. And I love the redemption arc of that. And this is why loyalty matters. Being true to yourself to be true to people you lead is if Jake has this self-awareness, he can, he doesn't have to you know, imagine he was trying to be somebody he wasn't right. Would that conversation have happened? Probably not, right? Or maybe he wouldn't have been confident enough in his social intelligence or humor to even take that on. Well, let's just so, be honest. It didn't happen because I wasn't aware of who I was. Correct. And we knowing we, what I know now would yeah. trigger that conversation. Like, right. no, okay, this is my role. This is my specialty. I I know I'm understanding him. I know I can connect with him. I know how I'm going to connect with him because I've done it before. Like I I have I have both the science and the art in my mind of who I am and how to utilize my strengths to step into this issue. Right. Instead of just right. Instead of just coming over, whack him on the back of the head and be like, dude, what the hell is your problem? Let's go. <laughs> well, and, and that's kind of the tough guy culture that can be at least in men's sports. Right. You know, I'll just, but there are also certain people that have based on who they are, their role in the team and, and their personality that they have revealed to the team up until that point. And let's, let's be clear here. When we talk about the role on the team, there is the physical attributes of that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like I am the star player because I am the most talented. Yep. But there's also the, the personality point. Okay. And we've, we've talked about this as a quote unquote glue guy, but it goes beyond that, right? The superstar mm-hmm. will have kind of that typical like alpha male personality. Right. Um, and you'll see some of this in professional sports because it's most talked about, right? You have this guy who's talent wise, people are looking at him like this guy should be the best player on the team, should be the best player in the league, etc. 
but the personality doesn't match that. It's not that like alpha male, take no prisoners, you know, and, and I think that's the people, that's the thing that people have a hard time articulating, especially when it comes to, let's just take the big one, right? The LeBron versus Jordan debate. Yep. The alpha male mentality that Jordan had, you're looking at LeBron, he's 6'8". What, the, the guy can't, there's nothing he can't do on a basketball floor better than probably anyone that's ever played. Mm-hmm. But there is this alpha male mentality that, that Jordan had that fit that role better than LeBron James had or has. Mm-hmm. Okay, LeBron has a different personality. Therefore, his role is slightly different than what a Jordan would have. Mm-hmm. Okay? That goes through every role on the team. The superstar has to have one certain personality. If he's really talented, but his personality is more of a distributor or he just def- he tends to defer personality wise mm-hmm. and you're trying to run everything through him mm-hmm. um in a in a very specific in a in a certain way it can it will hurt a team mm-hmm. okay and this goes through to like the second best player the third best player you have to take into account who they are as people mm-hmm. because it does affect how they play it affects how the team plays mm-hmm. and this oftentimes gets it's looked over, but that's why we want to look into who we are. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, I'm not the superstar player. Yeah, let's say I'm the fourth best player. But if I truly know who I am in my role on the team, I'm gonna look to get looked at as the second best player, even mm-hmm. though my skills don't match it, because I understand how to relate to my teammates. And it makes everyone around me better. And it's it's crazy how that personal side of things affects the performance side of things. Maybe we need. What was our one thing? Our one of our first episodes, we were going to be consultants to like executives of like MLB teams or something. That was funny. This is another avenue that, and I've thought a lot about this. And I'll admit, you oftentimes scratch your own itch or you know make the thing that you wish you had. I've done that over and over and over. Jake, I don't know how to describe. I would kill for not literally people. YouTube, don't get me. Uh, is a new captain's academy. Captains come every year. It seems like in every sport, most sports, right? It would be so beneficial to, and it doesn't have to be via. Don't get me wrong. There's a thousand and one ways to do this. The identification or even of elements, a better picture of who you are. And how, and so there is who you are. Okay, let's just say your character strengths in this case. What role you play on the team, multiply those together. What do you get? And be able to deliver that to the coach. Like, and that's just your captain or captains if you have more than one. Your roster, like a basketball roster, to be able to sit, like if I had, if I could do it again, one of the few things I would do in terms of building a team and, and a coach or coaching for what lasts is teaching my athletes not just the game and i and i don't want to add on to coaches you have a lot to do don't get me wrong if i were to go back and i had the time and space and know what i know now i would identify very simply here's what i know about my players bring that to their awareness and then bring them on my team of how can you best serve our goal wherever we're trying to get in your trajectory of in your talent and there a new captain's academy, though, Jake. Strengths based captainship, captainmanship, captainship. I don't know how to say that. Would be amazingly beneficial. I would have, it would have saved me so much in authenticity and made me feel better as a person versus worse that I wasn't the rah rah guy. Uh, would have been great. And, and I don't know if it would have mattered what we would have done, just that. I would have been valued for who I already was and then being able to use that to have conversations like you just had. So, yeah. And I think the important thing is we, we tend to put people in a box and, you know, captaincy, I think in a lot of people's minds elicits a certain type of person. Yes. And I don't think that that is accurate, you know, in in the description that, that in the story that we have, like that team, I wasn't, I wasn't your quote unquote leader. Um, I wasn't the best player. I wasn't the most outspoken player, et cetera, et cetera. Like we had other, we had other players that we looked up to that were more of leaders on the team. Mm-hmm. But in that story, could I have fulfilled that role and been a leader on the team? Yeah, absolutely. Would that have been a an area that the 
the quote unquote kids that we looked up to or that were captains on the team, could they have fulfilled that? Probably not based on their strengths. Probably not. So we, especially when you're, when you're dealing with high school kids, middle school kids, I mean, this happens well into adulthood, but it starts really at this age is we, we put people in buckets, mm-hmm. right? Well-known cultural buckets. He's a jock. He's a brainiac. Um, she's one of the pretty girls. Like we, we just put people into buckets all of the time. Yeah. And I would say I was very fortunate in going to a small private institution where <laughs> I'd show up to school and I'd be <laughs> one moment. I'd be the class clown. The next moment I was the class president. The next moment I was the jock. The next moment I was speaking to people in Latin. So like people are complex, right? And that's not to say, oh, look at all the things that I think everybody has that to them. Um, but culture and the people around us so often put us into boxes and then we just fall into that box. We're like, oh, okay, that's how everyone views me. That's where something like this comes in. And I think it's so important if we shared this with kids, like, look how diverse you are. Look how Look at all the different strengths that you have at your disposal that you can use to influence the people around you, to lead the people around you. Yeah, it might not be the guy who's standing on the stage going, hoorah, Mm -hmm. let's go knock some skulls. You know, he's probably a person in the audience that can keep the three people around him sane. Yeah. And and I think that was Walt Whitman who said, you know, we contain multitudes idea. And I know I'm using that a little out of context, and that's okay. I get to do that. Well, let's go back to the Red Sox. Do you think everyone looked at Ted Williams as a leader? Like the guy? Was Ted Williams the guy? Well, he was the glue of the friendship. I I think in terms of athletics and force of personality. And he obviously did that for his, he was running from his own demons, his childhood, his crappy childhood. I, I would say so, but there was things that he could not fulfill for those three or those four. Right. Right. I mean, keep going on here. Let's let's. I mean, we obviously read the book. We we did more of a deep dive into their personalities and who they were and how they interacted. And I guess let's back up. Let's take a bigger view here. You know, the the Boston Red Sox need to win Game Seven of the World Series. Who's standing up in the dugout to give that speech that everyone's like, okay, who's going to talk now? If you just not not even so much the team members, but if you just asked the fans, if you asked the general public, you know what? Who's going to be given that rah rah speech? Who's who's the who's the guy that's going to get the Red Sox going? Mm-hmm. Well, it's Ted Williams. It's actually got to be Ted Williams, man. He's he's the he's the guy. He is the guy. When you think of the Boston Red Sox, you think of Ted Williams. Mm-hmm. But based on what we read, maybe he would have. Maybe he would have. But it would have been what? It, it would have been Pesky. Yeah, I well, I think so, but it was Bobby Dewar, right? Like, even if if Ted Williams got up to speak, it was probably because Bobby Dewar was like, "Hey, we need something from you here, Ted." That's right. Yeah, right. We just, just a little something doesn't have to be doesn't it? But we need to hear you get up and and get us going a little bit, right? Like that that kind of leader behind the leader thing mm-hmm. is is a really vital role. It, it's not just one person doing it themselves. No, and and we sometimes, you know, we look at guys' contracts, at least at the professional level, and maybe their disappointment on the field, and then we realize that their whole contract could come down to that one moment. And I have a particular guy in mind. So, I, and quote me if I'm wrong on the player, but I'm almost sure I'm not. Is Chicago Cubs, Cleveland, then Indians, now Guardians. Who was it? They had this fluke rain delay. Chapman blows this this opportunity, right? And now they're in the dugout, not, or in the in the clubhouse. Who was the guy that consoled Chapman on the Cubs before they won the World Series at that time? Do you remember? I'm gonna guess David Ross. It was not. It was Jason Hayward. Oh, now. At, no, see, that, that kind of proves my point, so I'm glad you got it wrong. I wasn't trying to make you get it wrong, but I'm almost a hot thousand percent positive. It was Hayward who consoled him and said, guys, we got this. It's okay. It's going to be all right. At that time, in that context, now, if you have not, if you weren't, if you're a little younger or maybe you didn't follow baseball as much, Jason Hayward was not playing well. He was not the leader or like at least in the statistical leader of that team at that time. 
he kind of came over from Atlanta, St. Louis kind of thing. And, and, and he got this big contract and wonderful player, wonderful person having a great year as of 2023 with the Dodgers. He was the one that stepped for it. I would say as a, you know, if I was a Cubs fan, that guy fulfilled all of his contract at that point. Don't don't even matter what came before, what came after. At that moment, when his team needed him, team needed his mo- his best. Um, they needed him most. He delivered, yeah. and he just delivered differently than maybe we think. Yeah, uh, I think we should move on to you. But to kind of put a bow on this, I think I've I've finally gotten around to succinctly trying to get across what I'm trying to get across is <laughs> <laughs> there are so many other ways to lead uh, as a player than being the guy who stands in the middle of a huddle and gives a speech. Yep. There are so many ways to be a leader in a team than being the person who leads the warm-ups. That starts with understanding who you are. Mm-hmm. And when you understand that, you understand the situations in which you excel. At least you start to, not all of them, but you'll start to. Mm-hmm. And when you start to understand those situations more and more, you start to understand how you can interject. How do I interject here? What, what, what is it? Oh yeah, I, I, I want to talk to him. I feel, I feel bad for, I, like I can sense what he's feeling, right? Or I know he's struggling. How can I know? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm a funny guy. All right, I'll go make you a clown funny guy. And you go in there and now you've just been a leader. Even if it's for a moment, right? No person stands up and leads 24 seven. No. It's such a rare thing. Okay, I shouldn't say no one. I'm sure it happens, right? If you're if you're the head of an army in a war, okay. But very rarely in life, even if it's a CEO, you're not the one taking front stage leading all of the time. Okay, there's people behind the scenes, there's people within smaller teams. So I encourage you to know yourself and understand that that information can be used to lead uh, in in all areas of your life. But it's it's tough to do if you don't know yourself. Really tough to do if you don't know yourself. Agreed. All right, let's let's play the game again, but maybe not as long. I'll let you choose and direct me. So I'm going to be a coach. So I'm still coaching, you know, periodically here and there. I'm going to coach as I move forward, um, in a lot of contexts. So my five. So let's go my signature strengths. Now I'm a little bit more segmented than you. Okay, a lot more segmented. Okay. So number one, I'm going to read them and tell you what they are, and then I'm going to have you pick one or two, and then we'll talk about how I might use those as a coach and just brainstorm that. So I actually fall under my top three, all fall under the wisdom category, gathering and using knowledge. So number one is creativity, original and adaptive ingenuity, sees and does things just differently. I am the black sheep of the family. Number two is curiosity, interested, seeks novelty, appreciates exploration, open to experience. Number three is love of learning, interested in mastering new skills and information, systematically adds to knowledge. This should not sound surprising to you as we're doing a podcast on such thing. I diverge on my fourth one of gratitude, thankful for the good in life, expresses thanks, feels blessed, so virtue of transcendence. And then the last one is forgiveness. It's the one Jake I have have in common, and that falls under our temperance. So merciful accepting of others shortcomings gives people around them a second chance lefts go of hurt when wronged all right jake of the uh, pick what sounds i like the novelty of this so pick something as a coach that you would say okay let's look at that how we might use that for you as a coach what, what let's just start with who let's give say. me the top give me the top three again they got just real quick so these were all all wisdom creativity curiosity and love of learning Okay, let's go with curiosity. How are you using curiosity as a coach? So here are some suggestions that came out. So thought-provoking questions, so kind of a Socratic method, as it were. Exploring new techniques and analyzing opponents and strategies. I will say that if you ask me which ones, if I put those in order, I do most, I would say it would be number two. I love a good 80-20. So that probably falls to me as a, and it falls under love of learning too, but I love to know what's kind of on the cutting edge. So before launch angle became launch angle, before this became this, I love to be out on the spear tip of that. So I could see myself as a coach being curious and we'd have to get nitty gritty on to which sport. Um, 
the technique that you could use. So I was the kid that read The Science of Hitting by Ted Williams. I read um, Rod Cruz, but I read those things to see what was coming next. I like new technology. So the MVP machine was one of my favorite books. So anything that allows you to kind of find that next thing does does go there. The one that I do second probably would be the thought provoking questions, like asking, like how how do you become a home run hitter? How do you go from Zobrist to Zarilla, which Jamie Savales helped do? The one I don't do as much, I'll say in curiosity, is analyzing opponents and strategies. Um, I guess I get caught up in too much of the first two. I, I've never been really into like. I don't know. Wooden didn't really scout anybody. I, I, I figure if you play to your strengths, I like to dictate how the game goes. So I, I don't, I guess the breakdown is interesting. Like uh, the puzzle of how might we attack this? Of, okay. This team plays, you know, a full court press. I don't have a fast team or a team that can dribble. Well, oh, how might we go about that? Those would be things that would be going through my head as a curious person. Nothing, nothing excites me more than finding a weakness in a team and then exploiting it. I just, it makes me so happy. <laughs> it's, it's dark, but it, it makes me so happy. You need to practice forgiveness of yourself. <laughs> oh man. Oh no, I'm perfectly happy with myself, but man, it, it's, there's, you know, look, you can call it pride, but man, there's nothing like making an adjustment at halftime and then just killing the other team because of it and walking off the field being like, <laughs> Yeah. I got them. Um, okay, here's my biggest question for you. So a lot of your strengths are wisdom-based. Totally makes sense, right? You yeah. are talking about putting people in the buckets, but you are you're the nerd. Right? Yes. You're, you're the Absolutely. you're the stuck in the book, want to know all of the things and stuff. Okay. But you're a coach. You're yeah. now face to face with a group of kids. Yeah. You got all of that knowledge, all that's wonderful. How are you connecting with them though? Ooh. How are you transferring all of that knowledge from your head and the excitement that you have learning about it, transferring it to their head, conveying that excitement, getting them to buy into whatever you're saying? Because at this point, all they know about you is you have some gray hair and you talk fast. And I talk fast. <laughs> um. So I, I bring it up because for me, it felt like a lot of the conversation was at least for me, when I saw humor, I was like, yeah, that's that makes sense because that's what I use to connect with people. When there's a team in front of me, I'm going to be, I'm going to bring levity. I'm going to bring laughter. That's how I'm trying to connect them to me and them to each other. Mm -hmm. So you got all the knowledge, all that stuff. For you, how are you connecting to those kids? That's a good question. So I'll give an example, at least in the hitting realm. So when... I'm just going to go into that situation of I'm just going to stay in the bucket too. All right. Uh, and then I'll move to another one is I was in charge of the hitting stations. Okay? So kids would come to me, we'd hit off the drugs machine, the T. Um, I would work with them, you know, in, in setting the goals, but asking them questions. Okay. How did that go? So I connected with them in terms of like in situ, like in the situation, instead of more just like constantly. And I would say creativity is where I connect with kids more. Uh, in this situation, it was is being able to deliver the information when it mattered to their goals and to their mission. Do you want to hit better? Yeah, of course you want to hit better. And so I would look at it and and be able to analyze their swing, strategize for how I would. Ooh, what technique would help them? And then ask them questions and then freak out anytime they succeeded. So like once you get that first one, they see my excitement and curiosity, like, ooh, we're going to get it. I don't know what it is, but allow that enthusiasm for learning to filter out of me. And then I would layer in, you know, like the, I do love to learn about people as well. So that was one that kind of come doesn't come up about, about this each individual person um but finding the creativity like ooh, i don't know so they would come to me with well i'm not hitting an outside pitch okay well let's try this and so they come to me with that novelty the anticipation 
that maybe I don't know the answer, but I'm willing to serve them and go find it for them. That would be how I connect would connect um, in that in that realm. That is a really good question. Where did what? where did humor rank for you? Um, and I asked because part of the thing you know, this is actually something you brought up was this joy, right? That happens from successes. That's what you just described. Yeah. Um, you, you know, in terms of the suggestions, you know, the I would be able to create a culture to reward creativity and reward problem solving. So like building that out of people, I'm not sure. You'd have to give me a second. Um, I don't know if it was middle tier or give me one moment, middle tier or bottom tier. But keep talking about your question out loud. Well, I'm curious because you just described humor. Part of humor is that kind of overjoyous response. Oh, well, yeah. if that's ranking low, but that's what you're doing for kids. Is it coming off as ingenuine? Um, that is a good question. You know, I, I just get excited about the learning. So I don't know if that's necessarily humor. So okay. I get excited when I learn about them, what makes them tick coming up with new ways to get it across to them. That's how I connect. Because not every kid, like when we did the industriousness and enthusiasm sections, not every kid can be a pro, like we did with the talent code. I mean, we talked about the master coaches from Daniel Coyle. Good episode, by the way. Go check it out. Connecting with each kid is different. My daughter responds a lot differently than this other kid versus this other kid. So kind of taking a creative, that's my number one, you know, novel, productive ways to get them out of them. I would say that if I was humorous, it would come across a little bit unauthentic. And this is why it helps to be self-aware and knowing what you bring. Um, I do have the answer, by the way. It is number 20 out of 24. It's in my bottom five. Bottom okay. five. Okay. Good question. No, I, was, I was curious because you were you were describing it. And I'm, I'm still trying to get at like what you're using to connect with the humans in front of you like what strength are you using is it creativity because you're how do you like how do you know that you're connecting with them okay you're using your creative brain you're coming up with different ideas to work on hitting an outside pitch hey what if we tried this way how do you know it's connecting with the kid i usually use results I mean, you can see it. You know, if I do A, I get B without getting too. I'm more of the the strengths of the head than I am the heart. I lead with the head and I get the heart on the backside. Um, and maybe that's our disconnect here. So, yep. Like what you just described to me, to me, was them understanding the activity, mm -hmm. but you're not necessarily connecting with them, like the human side of things. That's see number four. Yeah, oh yeah. So number four is is gratitude. So expressing gratitude and appreciation. So when I connect, okay. like I still do the thing. When somebody does something great, I say it. Gotcha. You did a great job there. Or reflecting on achievements. And so okay. like, let me give you an example. So we had one particular hitter. I, I, to be nice, she didn't know what she was doing at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. She was resilient though, and she listened and she worked hard. And by the end of the year, she she could hit anything. I mean, now she didn't hit it with authority, but she, you know, she was fast. So all she needed to do was make contact. So when we worked with her throughout the year, and now she you have to remember she's in the bottom of the lineup. And great kid, right? But needed confidence, needed a little arm around the shoulder. You know, she didn't need to be like needled. She wasn't obviously the best on the team. But what I was able to do, or at least use this strength in the question you're asking is, I was able to see and reflect on her achievements. Hey, do you remember where we started? You could hit maybe a couple of these. Look what you just did. Do you know yeah. how awesome that is? Yeah. And, it's, it, 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 and that's why I said I don't lead with that. It's just not my thing. Like I lead with these first three. I know a lot. I can use a lot. I can teach a lot. And then when I come at the end, I can praise for effort, like kind of like to Elm Code or other others that we said. It's praising for effort, praising for who they are. I can see that and invest in that person. 
Because I know you need both, right? Yeah. It, people yeah. don't always care what you know. You can be the smartest person in the room, but if you come across as a jerk or a know-it-all, it doesn't work. Yep. So to be able to come across and be grateful and to call people up, I'm much better at it in in writing than I am out loud in the moment. Sure. I need a little bit of time to. That's where I need sincerity. I, I'm come across as inauthentic if it's in the moment. Like, hey, just tell Jake he's good at something. Like, eh. but if you give me two seconds to think about the practice and I come back the next day, hey, Jake, I know that was a rough hitting session yesterday. You've been doing great working on curveballs. It's not yeah. easy. You're going to get it, buddy. Like that kind of thing. It's not this overly speech, but that would be how I can no, that, connect. That the makes sense. And I think you, I think you nailed it. I think we got at what I was asking. I would say, I'd say this. One of the hardest things to do is to be a friend of the Votas. Right? <laughs> Kevin, Kevin is, is kind of the poster boy for this, but the, the Elden, I, I grew up with his brother, his twin brother. Um, his dad coached me. This is okay. his his mom he kevin is very much like his mother too so everything can i say about kevin is it goes for his mom as well but the votas believe in you more than you will ever believe in yourself this is true and, and it is and why i say it's hard is because you you feel like this is going to sound negative i don't mean it to because i think this is one of the greatest things about you people is that you you didn't feel the need to live up to it yep like I'm pretty sure at one point the Votas think thought that I could walk on water, and like absolutely, I, I would stay away from bodies of water because I didn't want to disappoint them. <laughs> kind of a deal, but it is uh, to Kevin's point of appreciation, gratitude, yeah. celebrating the wins, stuff like that. Like I, I've experienced that my whole life, mm -hmm. um, and it comes from things that I haven't even demonstrated of doing. I mean, you know, the, I think the number one story that I would tell people when it comes to this is. Obviously, they're, Kevin's a baseball player, um, whole family, baseball, all that stuff. Never played baseball with them. Like, that was never my sport. Summer sport, I was playing soccer, and I know that they lamented that I never played baseball with them. And mm -hmm. to a degree, I did too. Like, I, it would have been so much fun. Um, and then it was like that all of our childhood until we got to about the age of 19. I want to say we were 19. Pretty close. Yeah, whatever. Uh, out of high school. I want to say, and Kevin was on a baseball team and they were short, they were short people. So this isn't the first time this has happened, but the first time I ever said, yes, I get a phone call, Jake, Jake, we're short guys. We need, we need someone to come play baseball. It's like, guys, I don't play baseball. This isn't a good idea. Like, and just the absolute belief in the fact that I was Barry Bonds or something. <laughs> no, 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 you'll be fine. You're an athlete. Get out there. You'll be fine. You'll be great. Um, guys, I don't, nah, Jake, come on, come on with us. It'll be great. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. The whole time I'm completely doubting myself. The whole time they're like, dude, this guy's going to go four for four in the nine hole. He's probably going to hit three bombs, you know, and if he doesn't, he's going to be stealing every base between here and Texas. Yeah. To let you know how that went. Um, I bunted the ball into my eye once. Uh, I struck out twice, uh, twice, three times. I don't know. I didn't make the one play that I had to make when it came to me at second. But mostly, like, it was a guy who had never played baseball out there going out against a bunch of 19 year olds who been playing baseball their whole life. You can imagine put together the pieces of that. Uh, but the whole time, I think even after I struck out, there's like, ah, that's all right. No yeah. big deal. You got this, Jake. Go at yeah. it. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> that was very accurate. Uh, you didn't do as bad as you thought. You have to understand the, the bar wasn't that that high. It, it was so funny because you, because I saw for a, for, for a first second what type of baseball player you could have been. Like just given practice, like you've been practice, you've been fine. But fielding was no issue. Running right, see, was no even issue. now. See, even now, this is what I'm talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I bunted the ball into my eye. For those of you. Who have ever watched baseball? I don't know. I've been watching baseball a long time. I've never seen anyone bunt the ball into their eye. He, he pulled and the even Kirby. after after self Kirby. <laughs> the dark joke. Even after all of that, he still like, oh, if he just would have had some practice, like <laughs> practice. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to to rewind like, and finish, you know, identifying same thing I did with Jake. So he asked me a very specific question. Okay, here's what you do. Here's how that would come up. I don't have to pretend to be the humor guy. There are coaches who are the humor guys. And I would defer to Jake if we we're on the same coaching staff. 
Whereas he could play that role. I could play this role. And then we, you know, we would balance each other very well on a coaching staff, especially basketball. For instance, we have that in common. Let's transition to, to parenting. Just pick one. Let's do a one V one for time's sake and say of your character strengths, Jake, which one do you want to use? I don't want to say most, which one do you want to, to focus on going forward? And I get that it could be all of them. Uh, when your kids look at you though, and I'll read yours again, just for everybody's sake, not Jake's sake or my sake. Um, how might you bring that to parenting? And now this is an open question. We didn't prep for this. We prep for everything else. Jake. So Jake has humor. He has fairness, his forgiveness, his perspective, and he has social intelligence. So as a future or current parent of an athlete, how might you use those going forward? What's one or two that stand out that you really want to make sure your kids see you and be like, yep, that's what I got from my dad. Uh, um, I mean, the one that stands out to me is perspective, because this would be the word that I would use most for parents is how quickly the perspective is lost or never gained. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we obviously love our children very much and I get it. And that has to be a focus, uh, but there's a lot of moving pieces and there's a lot of other humans involved and humans are flawed creatures. Uh, and I feel like that that perspective is lost very quickly. Um, but as a parent of an athlete, I I would always hope to put things into perspective of this isn't what gives you value. Um, if 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 we are looking at things that come out of athletics, what is it that we are looking at to gauge your quote unquote value? Um, mm -hmm. It's not how many goals you score. It's the attitude that you bring to each time you show up. It's the effort that you bring each time you show up. It's how you treat the people around you that are the things that I'm looking at. Okay, you score three goals, great. Yeah, we're going to celebrate that. Um, but I'm I'm not going to walk off the field proud of you just because you scored three goals. How did you treat others? How did you treat your coach? Um, how did you treat the referee? All of these like truly intangible personal things and not losing that perspective um, among success, amongst failure, that always has to, we want that to be a constant because that is that is life, right? You're going to have to treat people appropriately, whether, whether you had a bad day at work or whether you had a great day at work or, you know, whatever's happening in your family, that that's what we're after is can you take all of the ups and downs, the roller coaster rides and treat the people around you with respect, with kindness, with love, because yeah, go for it. No, no, keep do one more. I got, I got to take care of this, but do another one. So you have perspective, okay. do one okay. more and I'll come back and do another one too. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so perspective would be the biggest thing. And then secondly, I want to say social intelligence, but I think that's such an individual thing that is, almost developed. I don't know that ever, I don't know that I could like, preach social intelligence. Cause there's just some people who aren't super empathetic in that, uh, that way. Um, so out of my top five, I'd probably give fairness. And I think this ties in with perspective as well, is that you, in my mind, fairness is getting out what you put in, um, and not expecting anything more or less than what you put in. So, Again, the effort that you're putting in, putting that into perspective of, well, is it fair or not? And then trying to go in and, and, and deal with the unfairness would be kind of the, the secondary topic to that. But mm -hmm. um, like right now, especially my oldest, whether something is fair or not is a big deal to him. Well, that's not fair. It's like yeah. very rarely in life are things fair. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So really, I don't, and then it goes into perspective. It's okay to perceive if something is fair or not. Uh -huh. But what is what is our response to whether it is or not? Number one, if you do notice that something is unfair, are you able to step in in a way to make it fair? Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? I think there's there's so many great valuable things in teaching. Uh, through unfair situations that develops a whole human. So I'm going to go with perspective one and fairness two, if I'm going to take two out of my top five. Well played. And and under parents, if you're, or even 
coaches, players, whoever, you know, audience that's listening. Have you ever seen that graphic of like the parent taking a piece out of them, like a puzzle piece and giving it to their kid? Like this is a good example. And this, this is so beyond, oh, you're the captain or, oh, you're the best player on the team. You know, giving the best of yourself. Not that you, you expect your kid to take on your traits. Now, clearly Jake Jake's progeny has his similar characteristics of fairness. Huh? Imagine that. Uh, I This would be a really good challenge letter, like a, a challenge to write a letter to your athlete and some I've heard of this before where you say, I, I, this is my hopes for you, you know, and to say it using your strengths versus some lofty expectation, nobody could ever live up to because kids feel the expectations on them from their parents. It is very heavy sometimes. So to answer this from my five, my five, as I stare at them, the I'll, I'll use two that we talked about. Number one is just, no, no, no. I'll use three and four love of learning. Just the joy of getting better because that transcends the game. Like to, to be able to, like my daughter's in figure skating, to the joy of learning new moves. I couldn't do that. Now I could. Or how might I do that? Like that journey of going through the beginning, middle, like sucking to not sucking so much to actually being pretty decent at this. That is such a valuable thing. And then the other one is gratitude. Uh, kids having a grateful heart, that is not a default thing. Uh, we see a lot of entitlement around. And I look back, and that, granted, is one of my top five, and realize how good I had it with the coaches I had, the teammates I had. Not everything was perfect. I wasn't perfect for sure. Abundance of just, you know, even when I got hurt and I wasn't playing anymore, the first thing my dad says, well, you're. Okay, you're not going to play. Well, now it's time to get back. You know, it was immediate switch. It's like, be the thing that other people were for you for a, the next generation of kids. And the just to be grateful for, you know, all the work coaches put in for you, the things they say. So just overall, great, great for it. All right, Jake, let's wrap with uh, Eminem, metaphors and most valuable idea. And uh, we'll call it a day. So to me, so we're looking at loyalty, being true to yourself so you can be true to those you lead. I saw two, you can kind of maybe help me with this with a metaphor, is is kind of going all in on poker. So it's first identifying the chips you have and then really going in all in with them. I like that one a little bit. And then it was kind of a hat tip to you of like a perfect play. Maybe not a veer like Novocaine and remember the Titans, but you know, when you have your five things, and you play them, it's perfect. Like, I mean, it's a perfect play. You and Maybe you don't hit a Hail Mary every time, but you know it's going to be a positive play or you're going to get a gain of yards. So I saw those as two of the metaphors. So strengths and loyalty are like an all-in poker hand or a perfect play in a playbook. What do you, any, any metaphor or simile stand out to you? Mm hmm. I don't put you on the spot. That's just yeah. I thought of. Yeah, it's. You know, I guess <laughs> for me, knowing thyself is is really important, and I think it goes largely largely discounted and largely kind of unheard of. Um, and and I think it gets demonized as. Um, being narcissistic or being egotistical at, at some points, but even even kids, even kids who are young, um, you know, you start getting into middle school, high school, have them start learning about themselves, like what makes them tick, like understanding what their fuel is. Uh, number one is going to help you as a parent. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are certain coaching environments that you should be like, have your kids take a personality test. Mm -hmm. Right. And for them, it has to be nothing more than just goofy funniness. Right. Like, oh, mm -hmm. so and so's number one thing is humor. Yeah. Right. And and just put him on the spot. All right. OK. Clownfish. Tell us a joke. <laughs> and, like, pull out the whole Nemo thing. Just put him on the spot. Um, <laughs> That's funny. And things like that. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of like a rare baseball card. It is really rare. Like to find somebody who is loyal to themselves and loyal to other people. Those are two different things. Uh, what's a rare card? 
Do you have a rare card that really stands out to you? Like that's a good one. No, not off the top of my head. No, I don't have okay. a rare card. I I just remember reading Honus and me and the Honus Wagner card being so valuable because because oh, yeah. there's a few of them. Yep. Um, so we'll stick with that. Poker all in, perfect play, rare card. The most valuable ideas. I'll I'll let you top this off, and then I do have one thing I want, two things I want people to check out before we wrap. So most valuable ideas. Athletes, identify who you are. I agree with this. And prove it to yourself with small wins. Practice being, like we model with Jake, practice small ways to do your strengths, in this case, character strengths. Coaches, make smoothies. Like, figure out who's on your team everybody's an n equals one and mix them together you got strawberries blueberries raspberries a little bit of frozen bananas some peanut butter mix it together what does that taste like you know figure it out you got a whole team of those and then parents i say this came from the good life but step up like with your strengths step back like let others fill the gap like it takes a tribe kind of concept and then but never step away right so lead with your strengths I, knowing what those are, have others come in and, and help support your athlete if need be. Um, and the, but just don't step away. So be true to yourself first and then true to those you lead. Anything else on the, mo I mean, I like your idea for getting to know your athletes. Anything else you add on a big idea on loyalty? If you're going to tell me the most important thing about one person uh, and what will automatically turn me off of a person is if they're in genuine. Mm. Knowing who you are uh, and just being you I, I say this in, in interviews and, and things of that nature. Like, you know, who do you get along with best? I just simply tell people, people who are themselves. If you are genuine to yourself, I will get along with you. I don't care if you're the biggest jerkwad in the world. If you are just genuinely kind of that way, I will get along with you. It, it really is true. Um, and that's kind of the one thing that I look for in people. Are you comfortable being yourself? If you're not, why not? That you is were, you were made that way for a reason, and you've gone through your experiences to get you to the certain point that you're at in life for a reason. Embrace it. That is one thing I, I have an opening question, not a lingering question. We should just make a list of questions on what on these topics. It, like self-acceptance. The time it takes to become comfortable in your own skin is such a – like there's an awareness piece, but then there has to be like this stages of grief almost of like, oh, yeah, I wanted to be like that person, but I'm this person. That has to happen in the middle there, and I mean, and we don't have time to to, to get to it now. But that's one lingering one. Um, to wrap, here's two things. One, go take the VIA survey if you have not. All right, go figure out your top five, read them, learn about them, all of the above. How might you apply them to your context, your parenting, your coaching, your your athletics as a leader in whatever context that is? We'll also include the 340 ways to use your character strengths. This came out of Jane McGonigal's Super Better. We covered that under enthusiasm. But there was an exercise or a list where when you know your character strengths, it gives you ideas of ways to perform that. So identity-based habits. We took them much more sports applicable in this, in this case. They use them very broad in terms of life. So two things for you to go check out. Um, flashback. So you like this? Go check out some of the other themes we've covered. Industriousness, enthusiasm, friendship. We're kind of building a momentum here, Jake. This is good. Um, foreshadowing to you, we are going to be reading Todd Herman's The Alter Ego Effect. And this goes with being true to yourself. So that's coming up next um, in our second part on loyalty. And that's really where we're headed. We'll have two more at the end, which is much more about um, loyalty. How do you build loyalty um, with others? Uh, we want to start with that self-awareness so um like and subscribe to learn along with us that's where we are that's where we're going we're going to be here we'll be putting out the content follow us on socials jake kevin um leave comments we love hearing if anybody has any thoughts on loyalty um what you think about via character strengths how you might apply them and so forth um and go from there but again thank you for learning with us giving us the opportunity to teach and preach to you um and never stop learning jake final word you nailed it. Never stop learning. Love learning. That's a good thing. That's a good thing to take away. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. See ya.